And Lord Jesus, you are our hope, Lord. It's, it's your name in which we are saved, Lord, and we just come to you right now, Lord, to learn about you and learn about what you did when you were here, Lord, and how, the, how those things apply to us today. So, Father God, we just ask that you would fill us right now with the Holy Spirit, that these words, Lord, we would, they would just be deep in our hearts, Lord, and that we would apply them to our lives, God, and make disciples, Lord. And God, just continue to look to you for everything, Lord Jesus. And we just love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You want to turn to each other and say hi and have a seat? Hi. Hi. We weren't here uh, last week because we had a baptism, but uh, and that went pretty good. If it, if you haven't seen it or if you want to watch it, I believe it's on Facebook, on the Calvary Chapel Ontario site, so you can see it there. Or if you're Instagram fa- friends with my father, you can now watch that because we finally convinced him to put something on his Instagram. Um, but yeah, but before that, we were reading about how Jesus called the 12 apostles. Because before then... Uh, Jesus had, Jesus was just, he got out of the wilderness, he was going around doing his ministry, he, he'd done the, um, the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes, and he was gathering people because, well, there was, you know, there's miracles going on, and no, no one's ever seen anything like this in Israel, but he hasn't yet called the 12 apostles to him until now. Um, but as we go, and as we're going and we're learning about, um, we're learning through Matthew, I've titled this series, Be Disciples, because I think there's, there's kind of a lack of discipleship within the church, and, and I, I just mean just, just within the way that we love each other. Because, you know, when we can love the Lord, I think, as Christians, it's, it's not hard to love Jesus, right? He's very, he's very lovable. You know, he's God. Everything about him is great. He died for my sins. That's what's <laughs> I've done some pretty bad sins, and he still, he chose, he chose to die for mine. I love that. I love him. Praise God. But it's not easy to love people. You know, we can get, we can get super annoyed at the dumbest things. You know, let me rephrase that. I can get super annoyed at the dumbest things. Being a human being, being Sean. You know, someone may be just standing too close to you. You ever, you ever in a conversation, and they're just like right on top of you? Okay. You know, or they or just they they're mouth breathers. Like what are you doing? Is your nose broke? Come on. You know, whatever, you know, they, why do why do you why do you stand like that, Sean? Like this. You know, just whatever it is, it could be kind of annoying or whatever. And it could, you know, and there there oh, there could be real legitimate reasons why you might not like somebody. Maybe they wronged you. You know, and what is when when the scribes came to came to Jesus, and they said, what's the greatest commandment? He said, to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second one is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And, you know, that's, that's the, I think that's the hard part. But in this, in this Christian life, in this born-again experience, I don't, think in my, you know, I don't think you can love God and not love his people. Now, maybe you can love God more than you love his people, but remember, as we've been going through this, agape love is obedient action to what the word of God says. You know, God doesn't say, you need to emotionally, completely emotionally have that kind of love driven 24 hours a day. Because if that was the case, well, then I, I mean, I couldn't do that. I don't have anything emotion, like with a heightened sense of emotion all the time. It just doesn't happen. But what does Jesus say? He says, hey, if you love me, obey my commandments. And then he commands us before he leaves and uh, sends into heaven at the end of the Gospels to make disciples. And that's what I think is something that I've seen hidden in plain sight is that we need to be doing is making disciples. Because through discipleship, you know, iron sharpening iron and the bonds of friendship and brotherhood and sisterhood or even marriage within, within discipleship gets stronger. When we have each other's back, how important is loyalty? Now, you know why you know why loyalty means so much? It's because there's such a lack of it, it seems like. 
And, you know, just loyalty to each other within the bonds of Christianity, within, 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 you know, being followers and disciples of the Lord. You know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to be with each other in eternity. And that's something I think, you know, maybe, maybe pastors and teachers like to say, but do we, do we really believe that? Do, do we really believe that everything we're doing and everything we're practicing and learning is going to be eternal? Because I, I mean, naturally, I think we kind of think of this stuff in our heads as, um, you know, while I'm here on earth living, because that's our reality. Our reality is every day we get to get up. Praise God, I got up this morning. I heard someone say, every day is a good day if you wake up. You know, and every day that you get up, it's, it's um, you know, you just, you, you, you look at that as your, as your life, you know, whatever. But, but I've noticed Jesus. And he was, he was here in this life, and he said, like, those who seek to gain their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my name will, 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 gain, will keep it. And you see how eternally minded he was, because how eternally minded he is, because he is God. Because where he was on earth at this time, it was in his home. It says that earth is his footstool, in fact. And so he would walk around, and he kept talking about the kingdom of heaven, and he kept talking about the re- very real place of hell. And he, went, and, he, and he came to call the lost sheep of Israel. And as we get into this, um, into Matthew, we'll, also be, we'll be looking at Matthew, and periodically we'll be looking at Mark, and we'll be looking at Luke, because when you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you get, uh, you get what's known as the synoptic gospels, which is a theological term for meaning seen together. Um, Matthew, great on its own. Mark, great on its own. Luke, great on its own. But, um, but we, I, tr- I try to put these together with, all aspects because you get you get different perspectives of the same incidences so we have we have Jesus he's calling his apostles and then he's sending them out because at this point in time Jesus isn't isn't uh, isn't everywhere at once he's in a human form he's fully God but he's fully man as well and he's subjected himself to being a man you know thanks be to God he doesn't have the sin nature you know because Joseph is not his biological father, and seeming, it's, it, it is seemingly that sin is passed through the father to the son or to the daughter. He has a biological mother, which makes him a Jew, right? We went through all this, and we looked, uh, looked at all that, but he, his father is God. So fully God, fully man, and, he, and he's attracted crowds. And what I like about when he's preaching to all these people on the Sermon on the Mount, they're just everyday people like you and I. There's, they're not necessarily anybody special. They're they're especially probably nobody special because they're because of the area that he's teaching. They're prob- they're not scribes. They're not Pharisees. If you look at if you look at John the Baptist, you know he's just a voice crying out in the wilderness. It's believed that there was for that time is equivalent of like millions upon millions of people going to hear John the Baptist because it's something they've never heard before. And whether or not you talk to five million people in your life or you talk to five, you do what God has you doing. Anyway, so Jesus, I like that Jesus is talking to the normal human being, to the normal man or the normal woman. But now he's selecting people to disciple. Now I believe what Jesus is doing is setting the example um, on what to do. Jesus picked his apostles and he's using them right away. I mean, I imagine they would have been following him before they got picked. But now that he's picked them, he's sending them out because, like I said, Jesus can only be in one spot. So he's sending them out and he's equipping them. In Matthew chapter 10, we'll be picking up at verse 16. Oops, sorry. Jumped ahead myself. Chapter 10, verse 16 says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you, not, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Now brother will deliver up brother to death, and a father his child and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. 
and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. Uh, when they persecute you in this city, flee to another, for surely I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is not enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called his, the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. What I like about Jesus here is, is he's, he's equipping them He's giving them power and he, that we looked at last week. And then he's sending them out and he's warning them about what's going to happen, about like the worst case possibilities. But doesn't, doesn't God do that to us in his word? Like it's kind of amazing. And I was thinking about this and I you know, posted on Facebook thinking it's something all super theological, you know. But, um, but we serve a God who, who says, look, this is what's going to happen and this is how I'm going to be opposed. You know, and he, and, and, he says, and he says, these are the things that are going to happen, in fact. He tells us exactly what's going to come against him as he's, doing, as he's doing whatever he wants. He puts it in his word. You can read it in Revelation. And you know what's amazing about all that is that we're, we're waiting on one more promise to be fulfilled from God. The return of, the return of our king, right? We're waiting, on, we're waiting on Jesus. But it's funny because up until this point, they were waiting on, they were waiting on a few different things. But we see the faithfulness of everything that happened. And to me, that's just kind of cool. And I like that's just that we serve an, an all-powerful God that can say, look, this is what's going to happen. It's fine. You know, your, 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 your reward's in heaven at the very worst. What's the worst thing you're going to do to you is kill you? I was in, uh, on Saturday, I do the men's small group at, at Joshua Springs. And we were in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 13, 15. And... Um, we're in chapter 15, and Paul is reiterating how many people saw Jesus. So it's first Cephas, and then the 12, or the, no, the 11, and then, um, and then it was like 500 people. And you know what, we read that, and as Christians, I think we kind of take that for granted a little bit, just the impact of what that means. Like, yeah, okay, cool, yeah, the people saw Jesus. But I also think about this, is that real people saw a risen human being from the dead. And again, that just, that just kind of blows my mind in that, that these men, because at this point, I don't know if they fully grasped what was going on. I think they just kind of, as they went with it, and as they, as they obeyed the Lord and did what he said and cast out demons and healed, I, even, even that, those crazy things, I think they just kind of took it as it came, you know, like, okay, great. Because you see, when Jesus died, they were like, what do we do now? And then Jesus dies on the cross and he rises from the dead. And they're staring, they're staring God in the face in the realization that, that the person that means the most to them in the world is, is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, what's mind-blowing about that is that to a Jew, you know, they didn't, they didn't look at God as their father. They didn't look as God, at God as, as like that person, necessarily as that personal relationship of a family member. They looked, that's God. This is almighty, all-powerful God. We are his people. We are his children in that aspect. But, but I can't go and call him father because that would put me on an equal, even keel with him. And no one's like God. I mean, they're right. No one is like God. But then you have Jesus saying, I'm the son of God. And then he's comparing himself. And he's using words like I am to the scribes and Pharisees and really, you know, making them super mad. And in fact, crucifying him because of blasphemy, saying that he says he's God. And then when he rises from the dead and he proves that he is God, imagine that impact that that must have had on these men. And then they saw him with their own eyes. And it wasn't just them. It was 500 people. Now, what's, what's interesting more about that, on top of everything else I think is interesting, is 500 people, that wasn't including the women or the children that were probably there. They just didn't, they just wouldn't write that. They, would, they wrote men. That's how they did it then. So there was, there, was more, there was more than just, there had to have been, logically, more than just 500 individuals that saw the risen Lord. And you know how we are. If, if say, I was, say we had a conference here this last Saturday, and I was in here, and then on Sunday morning, I, I tell everyone from the pulpit, I levitated and I flew around the room. I know you guys would be like, no, he didn't. 
right? Isn't that how we are? If someone makes an outrageous claim and someone else has absolute proof, it's going on YouTube that you didn't do it. Or it's going on Yahoo News or CNN or whatever. God forbid, Fox. Or wherever. It's just, it will be disputed. But do you notice not one thing was disputed then? No one wrote, Jesus never walked on water. Jesus never fed 5,000 people. Jesus never rose from the dead. And so these men, that they've they seen the Lord, and they're going out, they're being sent, and they're being told what's going to happen to them. And I, think that's, I just think that's amazing about God. And as I was going, and I was, I, was, I was reading, and I was studying all this, and how Jesus is sending, something popped up to me, and I wrote this first in my notes. Romans chapter 2, verse 4, it says, Or do you despise the richness of his goodness? forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. And God is kind to sinners. And that's what Jesus is sending these, these men out, is to reach the lost sinning sheep of Israel. It's a completely different attitude the world has to their enemies. Remember the Beatitudes. Jesus died for all. And that's something else I think about, too, in that, in the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. I was thinking the other day, if I, if I died for somebody and then I have the ability to claim them, you best believe I'm going to claim you. If I died for you and for some reason I was allowed to claim you, whatever that means, of course I'm going to claim you because I died for you. I'm going to be, if, if I don't get what I'm promised or dying to you, this, well, why did I die? No, I'm not trying to cheapen what Jesus did, but can you imagine even more so with the heart of God? I died for you. I want you. How many of you have ever wondered if God really wants you? How can, how can God love me just as much? How can God really feel that for me? Because he's God. And he made you. He made you in his image. And he wants that relationship. And he died for you. You best believe that he's going to want you. And what does he do? He equips up, equips us like he equips these apostles to go get you. He uses us. He uses his word in us. And then he tells us what's, what's going to happen. We're going to be persecuted. But it's interesting. Keep that in mind. In Romans 2, 4, it says it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And seemingly the goodness of God leads the sinner to repentance. Really, everyone can fall into that category. Everyone in this room, not just the unbeliever, although kind of focus on it's the goodness of God that calls the, um, the unbeliever to repentance and to him. Because, well, I mean, who would, I mean, I'm sure it can and I'm sure it could be effective because every word of God is effective, but, you know, how many people are saved because they're, you know, oh, yeah, you know, I just, you know, the whole fire and brimstone thing. Yeah, the terror of the Lord saved me. Now, I'm not saying that can't save because that very well could. I'm sure there are people who are like, you know, I just don't want to stand before God one day and answer to all these things that I did. That's great. However God used, you know, whatever, however God used to get you, you know, into the kingdom, that's wonderful. But, but it's the goodness of God that draws, that attracts. It's, it's God's nature. The sinner is called out by his life, out of his life by God's love. A disciple, and it's interesting, a disciple, a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, who's born again, sealed by the Holy Spirit, worships God the Father. A disciple calls a sinner because the fear of the Lord. Because we know 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 through 11. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Not, not, just, not just us as Christians, right? So does every, so is everyone else. That each one might, may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we, pursue, we persuade men. But we are well known to God, and I trust are all well known in your consciences. So, so, let's just, so looking at what I'm saying, on one hand, it's the goodness of God that draws the unbeliever to repentance. But it's the terror of the Lord that motivates us to talk to people. Now, not that, don't get me wrong, we're not walking around going, okay, don't, you know, you don't, you're going to get destroyed. You know, we're not walking around like cowering, we're not around terrified of God, because, you know, we're sons of God, we're joint heirs in Christ. But going, man, but just knowing within our hearts, it, bro, it's, you know, 
to, to, to answer an absolute judgment for your sins. An absolute, absolute, repent, you know, absolute being rewarded for your sins. You know, I think about the evil things I've done. I think about the evil thoughts I can have. I, I mean, I could be in like, you know, a Calvary Bible Institute class, you know, just completely with, with an amazing teacher and awesome future, wor- you know, worship leaders. And all of a sudden it'd be like, where's sin ever go through my head? <laughs> what did that come from? It's because I'm a, I'm a sinner. It's because I'm a human being. I'm flawed. I'm, I'm saved by grace. And one day there will be, there will be an answering for everything. And if you will, you can turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20, starting at verse 11. Sorry, I'm using my blue letter Bible. Revelation chapter 20. Verse 11, it says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up their dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his work. The, um, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And I just can't help but think of, you know, those people who... who who have to answer to that. You know, guys, all sin sends you to hell. Now, how will all sin be judged? I just, I just frankly have no idea. Is there different levels of punishment in hell? I just don't know. And I can't sit here and tell you for certainty. It seems like in Sean, you know, speaking as Sean Yersioli, it seems like there is to me. You know, because I can't imagine, you know, like the guy who just kind of passively never accepts the Lord and, you know, kind of lived a good life is going to be suffering the same same exact next to Satan and Hitler. I don't know, though. I don't know. That's the thing. But either way, standing before God to answer to anything that I have done, when I have the out, when I have the, the Redeemer, I know that I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that I have the answer. If you have the answer to get someone out of something extreme, like let's say going to hell or whatever, whatever it may be, wouldn't you wouldn't wouldn't you be obligated to tell that person? Like if it was anything in life. Yeah, if you go in there, you're gonna burn to death. If you go if you if you knew for a fact that if I go hopefully this doesn't happen, if I got on the freeway and crashed, you would tell me not to go on the freeway. Isn't it even more so to go and try to make disciples? You know, it's, it's as if we pull them out of the fire, as if we tell, people we're, we tell people as if we're pulling them out of the fire even. Even if that's your motivation, we need to do it. But it's more than that within discipleship. It's raising strong Christians. I, the, you know, in, the la- in, in, in all my you know, long years of life, I've seen through, through Cavi Chapel and the church, you know, these kids that grow up in the church and then they go off and they go to these universities and then suddenly some of these Christian kids are becoming atheists. Or maybe even worse, they're becoming Democrats. No, I'm kidding. Just uh, joking. It's a joke. I, don't, I love Democrats. Don't get me wrong. Email Pastor Mike for that one. Um, you know, and we, you know, what, what, did I do something wrong? Well, you know, let's disciple each other. You know, I don't want to. I'm not trying to blame the church or anything. I'm just saying, if I, if I, it's just you know, you see what the problem is. Maybe it's maybe we need to start tightening up, like I've been saying. You know, sitting down with one another, let alone sitting down with our family members and doing devotions and praying with one another. And and you know, if you're if you're older, if you're an older lady, sit down with the younger lady and be like, "What's going on in your life? Let me tell you what I did when I was your age. Don't do this, whether you're a boy or a girl, or a woman or a man." But we know, and I, I like that. So what, I think that's what Jesus is doing. I need you guys to go out to reach more people. I want to tell more people. I want, I want more people to be saved. You know what? It's our job to gather people to the Lord. It's God's job to judge those people. We don't judge them. 
if we think someone's very just, you know, there's no way he's going to heaven, all the more reason to go reach that person. Because it's the goodness of God that will lead him to repentance. I don't think these hardened, atheist, Satan-worshipping, just evil people come to the Lord because, oh, there's a hell. No, I think they're watching you and they're saying, man, they just have something that I've never had because I've had a terrible father. Because I've never had good, great friends in my life. Because no one's, because deep down inside, I know for a fact, no one has ever loved me. And I would give anything to see that love poured upon me that you guys have for each other. And I really hope people would look at Calvary Chapel, Ontario and see that. I really hope people would look at Sean and see that. You know what I've seen? People like, I, I have atheist friends and they tell me, they, they say, they, they, you know, praise God, but they say they see the difference in me that I believe what I'm saying. And I think when you're practicing discipleship and we're going out and we're doing these things, and it's starting with each other, and we're tightening up with each other, and we're, and we're uplifting each other, and edifying each other, and keeping each other accountable. That's what people will see. That's the difference. That's loving, that's loving each other like you love God. But Jesus says, he, he sends out these men. He says, behold, they send you out a sheep in the midst of serpents, a sheep, servants, and doves. The attitude of God, even when we are, we are to reflect Christ, if someone asks what Jesus is like, you could say that Jesus is like verse 16. Be, behold, I am as sheep, I'm, I'm a sheep and wolves. I'm as wise as a serpent. I'm as harmless as a dove. If you read and then compare that, that and compare that to the Beatitudes, I think God's saying, this is what I'm like. This is what you need to be like. I'm meek. I'm poor in spirit. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not hot, you know, all proud. That's one thing I've really been learning interesting. It, it, like, I've been really learning lately is that God's not proud. For some reason in my head, I think, well, God's allowed to be proud because he's God. God's sovereign. Literally, like, God can speak anything into existence. But he's not proud. He's humble. He, 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 he mourns. When we mourn, when you're mourning, something, someone passes away or whatever, your, you know, your dog dies, your aunt dies, whatever, God's mourning with you. He comforts. He has a meek attitude. He hungers. I know he hungers for righteousness because he hungers for holiness in us. Be holy, be holy because God is holy. He wants to see us being like him. He's merciful. I know for a fact we all know that. Think of your personal experiences of coming to the Lord. He's pure. These are all the Beatitudes, by the way. These are all the things that God is saying that we ought to be because he is like that. He's a peacemaker. And last, what he's saying to them, he's persecuted. You know how he's still persecuted today? Every time you are persecuted because you belong to him. What did he say to Saul on the road to Damascus? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul's like, how am I persecuting you? He's like, every time you hurt one of mine. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, in that we are sheep of God. We are wiser than serpents. A serpent has to, has to rely on its wit to survive. I guarantee you, if anybody in here sees a big snake in their house, your first instinct is probably going to be to kill it. Or that might cross your mind. If you're anything like me, I'm going to think keep it. But the snakes are just kind of cool. We don't go into stupid situations, is my point with the serpent. And harmless because we reflect Christ to others. And it's the goodness of God that gets men and women. Harmless as doves because we reflect, God's to, we reflect God to others that he is good. And I just like how Jesus is perfectly on, um, honest with us in persecution. This nature is contrary to the nature of sin. Sin is destroying everything. If humility is the, is the driving common denominator of holiness, then pride is the common denominator in the sin nature that is destroying this entire universe. I mean, everything in this universe is on a countdown to zero. The sun is technically burning out. The, the whole universe... Uh, the, like, the, you know, I don't know, I, I, I don't study these things at all, you know, like, but it's because, you know, my brain can wrap around that, but it's kind of expanding, I think, or something, and, but everything in the universe, even the power of the black holes and gravity are kind of going out, 
it's all kind of winding down to zero. That's because there's, there's sin. Sin is the, natu- is the unnatural, natural part of life. It's unnatural because God did not intend sin. And it's been killing us ever, ever since Adam. I mean, think about what Adam's, Adam's sin was big because it was the first sin. But in, in, in looking at it, it wasn't that big of a sin. He just he ate of the fruit. So did Eve. I mean, you know, it's not like he turned and murdered Eve right away. I mean, it, it escalated. <laughs> it escalated very quickly. His sons were murdering, and you could see the effects of sin. But sin is an unnatural part. Unna, is an, it's, I'm sorry. It's an unnatural, natural part of life. So humility is, humility is a common denominator, common denominator of holiness. Pride is a common denominator of, of unholiness or of, of our sin nature. And so people want to persecute that because if you're, if you're, if pride is what drives you, pride being sin, pride being separate, pride being separated from God, if pride is what drives you in this life, then something contrary to, to what you feel is the complete norm of your life is going, is going, is going to rub you the wrong way. Holiness is going to rub you the wrong way. It's going to come off as, as hypocritical. It's going to come off as judgmental. Even if, you're, even if you're following the Beatitudes to the T, even if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, at first the devil's going to speak lies to his own because you know what? The devil, for whatever reason, doesn't want to lose his either. That says that the enemy is the... I don't claim to know the enemy, by the way. I don't study the enemy that much. You know, Satan, I just don't know. I'm kind of glad I don't know a lot about him. Just forget that. But the enemy is the father of lies. And I've always wondered, how can God sit there and go, look, I'll tell you exactly how all this is going to go down to the T. You're going to be persecuted. Here's what's going to happen towards the end. It's going to just keep getting worse and worse. And then once, once the rapture happens and once revelation kicks off, here's exactly what's going to happen. More persecution, more people blaspheming me. And, and, then, and then I'm going to defeat the devil with no problem. You know, and then I'm going to defeat the, the armies of the Antichrist with just a word. And I look at that and I go, how can Satan read that, know that, and be like, I'm still going to do this exact thing? Because he's the liar. Because <laughs> Sam's making fun of me. I see that. Because he's a liar. You know what I've noticed in life? Because I met a few of these and because I've, I've kind of done it sometimes. You know what the, the best liars are? The ones that lie to themselves and believe it. Wouldn't that make sense of Satan? That's why, that's why I think he's going. Because he's, he thinks he can win. He can't win, by the way. Because, I mean, it's all tied to the very voice of Jesus Christ. That's why his word is so important. That's why heaven and earth, as we read, will pass away, will hide away from God. But his word will continue forever. That's why I think we're going to keep on experiencing learning in heaven. Why, we will keep, why, why things in his word will keep on making sense. We'll do it from a glorified stance as, as Jesus is. But we will, we, we're going to hang on his word into eternity. That is completely contrary to a, to a person who wants to do things of themselves, who are, you know, t- you want to know what, what a sin nature is like? It's everything that the Beatitudes is not. Those who are in the power of sin will oppose God. God doesn't want us to be shocked when, when we are so harmless and good as to why someone would treat us this bad. I think we have such an opportunity in the United States we can think sometimes we're being persecuted because maybe the left media says Christians are dumb. You know, and I, I'm just saying, in the United States, we still have our freedom. And I think there's a, there's a fine line between really being persecuted here and just rubbing people the wrong way. Either way, it, yeah, I guess technically it's persecution. But keep in mind, as you're here and, and we have the opportunity, these freedoms within the United States, we can take advantage of those things. We have the freedom, and, and even more so, to, to get the word out. We ought to be utilizing those things, even when people disagree with us, which is their God-given American right. So what do we do every day? As it says in Ephesians 6, we put on the full armor of God. We, we, we pray without ceasing. And when I say that, you know, guys, pray. It doesn't have to, you don't have to have a specific formula to pray. 
like, it, God doesn't not hear you because you don't say, dear God. Like, if you don't say, dear, in the beginning of a prayer, it doesn't count or something. No, what if you're just in constant communication? Because, you know, in the, in, in the aspect of persecution and, and in the aspect that you're, by the way, supposed to love the person that's persecuting you, how many times do you have to give that person over to the Lord? You need to be praying without ceasing because God wants that person. So give God that person anyway within your mind, within your heart, and do it in prayer. Are you fasting for, the, for these people that are persecuting you? It's hard for me to fast because I like to eat. I'm very fleshy in that. Food is good. I have hyperglycemia. I have, I have high sugar. My mom knows more about this. I don't. I just don't eat sugar. But um, so whenever I don't eat, my body goes, what? Like more so than what your bodies would do. It's like, why are you not doing this? For some reason, I'm over here. My body's right here. What are you doing this, Sean? I'm like, Cause, you know, because, you know, I got to fast. And so because I'm super hungry, I, I always kid my prayers, my prayers count more. But really, it's, it's <laughs> but really in, when you're in prayer, when you're fasting, you know what you're doing at the very least is you're denying your flesh so that the next time something comes along, some sin or, or temptation comes along, you're able to defeat it more because your, your spirit is strengthened because you're communing with God. I don't think fasting convinces God more. I think he tells us, he, he commands us to fast. Jesus says to his apostles and his disciples, when you fast, not if you fast. When you give, not if you give. He expects us to do so. So are you doing, in the aspects of agape love and loving your, loving your enemies, are you fasting for those people? We put on the full armor of God. Because you know why? You know what that full armor of God is? It's putting on Christ. And it's funny that Sean, Sean Turin, in his announcements, he read this, he, he stole my verse, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And I've always wondered, what, what does that mean? So in the aspect of going out, as you're going out, and as you're, Jesus warned, you're going to be persecuted, I think you get up every day, and, and you put yourself on that altar. Every day you get up, and you offer yourself as a living sacrifice. But guess what? This is what I like about this. It's, it's nothing that you are. You offering yourselves as a living sacrifice, you're not worthy. Look at the sacrifice system in Israel, the mercy seat, and all that they had to do. It had to be a, it had to be a lamb without blemish. It had to be a lamb without a, a geneal, genealogy, whatever, a, you know, his, his dad couldn't have gave him something bad, whatever that word is. And it had to have been, it had to have been, uh, and he couldn't have, and he couldn't have any, like, marks or scars or anything. Look at Jesus. It had to have been Jesus. So it's not you every day. Look, God, I offer, I offer this piece of trash as a living sacrifice. God's going to go, you're not worthy. But who is worthy? Christ, and who does, where do, who does Christ say that you are? You're his. He lives in you. He dwells in you. You have fellowship with the Lord. So every day you get up and go, God, I offer myself with your son living in my heart as a living sacrifice. Then you're holy and acceptable. And, and you know why we don't like to do that? It's because you're on an altar. And guess what doesn't like to burn? Our flesh. It doesn't like to burn. We don't like to go up and go, God. <laughs> we like, I think we kind of like to say it because if we say these right things, you know, they count more in heaven. We go up there and we go, you know, God, okay, I'm, I'm a living sacrifice. But do you really mean it? God, what do you want from me today? What if God says, remember Sean was talking? I'm scared he's going to do this to me. Remember Sean was talking about fasting? I want you to fast. No, but what do you really want me to do today? <laughs> I want you to fast. All right. And so every day as you're going out and you're trying to reach people and you're going to, because you know what, even in, especially in discipleship, there's going to be days you're going, yeah, I'm discipling John over here, but uh, I just don't want to today. I don't want to do that today. Or talking to the, per, or talking to a person you, you well know is an atheist and that's going to, he's going to give you, he's going to give you grief back for talking about the Lord. Or whatever it is, every day, offer yourself as a living side. I have to do, I have to do that every single morning. Lord Jesus, you saved me. I'm your mess. God, in your economy, nothing's lost because for some reason, you have me in it. And to me, it seems like your economy is kind of messed up and that everything's lost because I'm messed up, but you have me. And because, Lord, you saved me, God, 
Lord Jesus, you died for me and that I belong to you. I offer myself to you back because you have me anyway. So I offer myself as a living sacrifice. It's nothing you do. It's not by works. Every day we have, to, we have to do that, not to be conformed. Every day is a struggle. Every day is fighting your flesh until one day, praise God, you die and you get to be with the Lord. And I don't mean, I'm not trying to be weird. I'm not trying to say, well, it's kind of some weird death cult. But absent from the body, present with the Lord, unless you get raptured and, and you get changed in a twinkling of an eye, we look forward to that. The absolute worst, absolute worst thing they can do to a Christian is what? Kill him? I don't know. The absolute worst thing you could do maybe is, is keep me away from my Lord, but you can't. Jesus is the sacrifice. A sacrifice, you could not have anything wrong with it. And through discipleship, we reach people because Jesus is in us. We offer ourselves. And then we reach people as you gave me, God. I'm going to give to others. And in this, in the, in the contrary nature of, spirit, uh, of this is, of, um, of, you know, of between pride, pride being the motivating factor of sin and humility being the motiva- motivating factor of uh, holiness, when you, when you put those things together, that's spiritual warfare. So we need to have the armor. We need to be prayer, prayed up. And so that's what Jesus is doing here. And he's warning them, you're going to go before him. Do not worry. You're going to have those words. You're going to have the things to say when you're standing before them. Because you know it, because you're in the word. Because here he, he gave them power. But I mean, he's also speaking of the future, the future of them. And that's how you have those things. You know, you know the, like, I, I still have, I've, I've said this before, I, st- I still have memory verses uh, memorized from second grade. I'm not trying to boast. I'm just, you know, actually, the, the, the well, the real reason I haven't memorized is because of the Holy Spirit, but also because my uh, my teacher, Lori Barrelero, put it in a stupid song. So I have my word I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalms 119, verse 11. You doing that with your kids? Second grade, I have that memorized. That, you know, the Ten Commandments, she, like, I remember she, uh, she was in the Ten Commandments, we got to Idol, she got a doll and put one big eye on it, so it was an eye doll. That's why I remember that. You know, and so, and so, so here, you know, what, you know, so when, it, when you're standing before men, and you're standing before rulers, if you have to do that, and you're like freaked out, and you're not thinking straight, and you're like, what am I going to say to this person? It's because you have the word deep, in my, deep, deep within, your, within your heart, even if it's through a dumb song. It's because you have the word in your heart because you read it every day. It's because you have the word in your heart because you, you're discipling one another or you're discipling your wives or you're discipling your kids. I promise you teach your kid, you read your kids the word, they're going to know it. If you, if, like I was, I was saying to the men on, in the small group, if, if, you, if you raised your kid and you read him you know, some part of the Constitution every day, he's probably going to be a lawyer. So, you know, he's going to know the Constitution. If you, whatever you pour into your kid's spongy minds, they're going to know it. And even us, as we study the word, and that's what I believe the Lord's, as, as your mind, as, 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 you, as I put you out and put you forth into these things, you have the Holy Spirit within you, who, guess what, knows the entire Bible. But it, you need the faithfulness. You know what God told me? He's, God told me, if I'm faithful to put in the effort, he'll be faithful to do the work. Are you putting in the effort? You know, it's not by work, Sean. Yeah, absolutely. But God, God doesn't expect me just to flop around up here, although I do. Or I feel like I flop around up here. So we put in the work, and that's what, he's, that's what he's doing to his apostles. And guess what? That's what he wants us to do. Moving on, chapter 9. Um, nope. Verse 19 is as action by faith, but also by reading and practicing the word of God. God speaks through us, through his already spoken word. Philippians 2 I'm sorry, jumping ahead. Um, family will be split over Christ, especially at, at, in the future, especially during this time. Hated over the name of Jesus, but remember that Philippians chapter 2, 10 through 11 says that at my name, of, that at, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And in my notes I put, we bow now. I, I honestly feel when we get to heaven, we're going to fall for our knees, not only because, you know, God, 
and, and the glory and the power of God, but also because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be our normal reaction because we practice that now. And if you're not, it's because you're not praying. If you're not, it's because you're not praying for your family. You're not praying for disciples. But I know you, I, I know you guys do that because I, I know a lot of you have done it for me. And so I believe we bow now at the name of Jesus, and we're going to bow then because it's going to be what's natural to our spirits. Pray without ceasing. Be in the word. Do not fear. 27, whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light, and what you hear in, the, what, hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. Just go, get people, I'll judge them. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him. Remember, God motivates us because the terror of the Lord to reach people. But fear him who is able to destroy both body, soul, and body in hell. And not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. Guess what? God's in complete and utter control of everything. So if he tells you to do something, he's not, you're not going to die, get to heaven. God's not going to go, oh, Sean, dude, I wasn't looking. I'm so sorry. Well, then I'll send you back. You know, no, he's not. He, he's going to be like, yes, I wanted you. This was your appointed time. God's in complete control. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear. Why does God ever command us not to fear? Because we do. We fear you know, it's a good, good thing to look at these commandments in the Bible when God commands something. It's probably because we need to be commanded it. Do not fear. Therefore, you are more value than many sparrows. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. And whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. That is something I cannot wait. That's, that's, that's what I want the most in this Christian life, to be honest with you. Maybe it's selfish to me, but that's, the, that's what I want to most, is when I die and I'm standing before God, it's for, the, it's for the Lord to go, God, this is Sean. He is mine. I died for him. He accepted me. This is Sean. And I really want God, the Father, to look at me and go, yeah, I know. That's what I want the most. Do you guys yearn for that? Do you yearn for that for your, for your spouses, for your ch- children? You're in for that for the people here. This is why discipleship's important. This is what God's telling us to do is to reach others. Let's practice that on each other. Let's practice reaching each other. Because, I mean, what's the worst that's going to happen? And I think that the worst that's going to happen is it's going to be the best thing. We're going to reach people. Do not think that I come to, to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged swords. Any two-edged sword. <clears throat> I heard a pastor was saying about Pastor Raul Reese. There's, excuse me. There's times that he, he's getting ready to go up and talk and he's crying because he knows when he goes up there, the things he's saying to the congregation is going to cause people to leave the church. The word of God cuts. The word of God might, I might, I will, I promise you guys, I promise that you, at some point, I'm going to hurt your feelings. But I promise I'll never not come up here as long as I have air in my, air in my lung and my dad decides I'm not a heretic. I'll, I'll hurt your feelings, but it's not me because I'm just going to go through the Bible. And the Bible says something, I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. And you know what? I know my father's the same way. He's probably going to hurt your feelings at some point because he's telling you what the Bible says. I know he doesn't want to. But also in that, that's why this, the world wants to persecute us, because they don't like what they're hearing. Do not think that I come to bring peace on earth. I do not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own ha- household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. You know what Jesus is saying right here? He's not saying that he, he, you know, he's, he's purposely trying to just to mess up families because God, God loves fam- godly families. He's saying, am I your first priority even before your wife, even before your children? That's what's going on. That's what God's telling you. That's why... To some people, it's not going to be that priority. We make, we make that our priority. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. 
He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of, in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. So we we press forward. We have we have power. We are sealed, and we're we're constantly full um, filled by the Holy Spirit. We are to have this thought process as. Uh, as we go and we make disciples. Because you know who the little ones here? It's us. It's every one of us, whether you're a child or whether you're, you're a 40-year-old man who's maybe homeless and lost and sitting there and God's saying, go talk to that guy. Maybe you're in a tie and a suit and, and you have a good job and he's walking down the street and he's telling you, go talk to that guy about me. That's the little one. We take the attitude of the Beatitudes in humility because it's the nature of holiness and we go when we reach the loss. Philippians 3.13 says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have app- apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. We reach forward in spiritual warfare. We reach forward by reaching the loss. We move forward in that. Yes, persecution is going to come, but you know, you know one way to know for sure that you're walking in the will of God is when the enemy is opposing you. Because if you're not if you're not opposing the enemy and you're not if you're not doing God's will, why would the enemy's not necessarily going to be going to be inclined to bug you? Although you know, keep that in mind, the enemy still might. That's not a guarantee you won't be attacked if you're not doing what God says. Because I promise you, as being in the being in the military at one point, no military on earth doesn't attack doesn't attack an army because they're not attacking back. Oh, they're just sitting there. Oh, well, we better leave them alone. Oh, you guys call timeout. No, we're going to come down you full force. The enemy does that too. We do that as well. We press forward. We move, we move on. We continue in this life. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just come before you once again, Lord Jesus, and I just thank you so much for what you did, for what you did on the cross, and just for saving us, Lord. Just, just fill us, God. Give us, give, us the, give us your heart, Lord Jesus, even here tonight, God. Help us to make disciples, Lord. Help us to press forward within persecution, Lord. Help us to have your heart and your attitude, God. Lord, make us worthy to be persecuted for you, Lord. Lord, put people in our paths to reach God. Whether it's And let it start here, Lord, I would say. And it seems like I'm saying that because you're telling me to say that, Lord, that you want us to reach each other, Lord. And then to reach the lost. So let discipleship start here. God is our heart, Lord. Fill us with that. We love you and we praise you and we worship you alone. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, please.